Hello class, uh, you're well on your way in your research uh, with regard to liberal democracy and illiberal behavior. We're learning about the War Measures Act from 1914, and then we're going to start thinking about the Emergency Act of 1988 uh, and connect it to some of the, the circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in right now. So you already understand a lot of terms and concepts that are going to be talked about and you are going to be using those in your reflections as we move through this extended lesson. Uh, before you listen to this lecture, I'd like you to read ahead, figure out what this is going to be about, and uh, read the questions so that you know what you're listening for. The first thing we want to talk about is a liberal democracy. What is a liberal democracy. Now we've used the word liberal a lot before and uh, with not such good connections. Uh, we used it when we're talking about different political views like the liberal party in contrast to the conservative party or holding liberal ideologies uh, as a, and progressive ideologies and liberal policies as opposed to conservative and traditional values and views. And uh, what we want to talk about is when we use the word liberal in terms of liberal democracy, we're not talking about it in this way. We're not talking about liberal policies that move away from the traditional standard of the Bible and what the Bible teaches on family, marriage, parenting, education, gender, sexuality, those things. Uh, in that sense, liberal really is used to mean to be free from God, to be free from his authority, to be free from his law. That's not how we're using the word liberal here. We also sometimes use the word liberal when we're talking about different forms or branches of Christianity. We talk about liberal churches or liberal theology. And although in reality there's only one Christianity, there is only one truly biblical way to interpret scripture, uh, we still use this term to define other branches of Christianity. So in the same, in a sense, it's kind of the same. It's holding liberal social views. So these liberal theologians, these liberal pastors have taken their own progressive beliefs about family, about marriage, about children, about education, about government, and then they read them into the Bible. So it really makes man authoritative over scripture rather than man submitting to scripture and God's word. It really puts God in the back seat, puts man in the driver's seat. Again, that's not how we're using the word liberal when we're talking about a liberal democracy. Here it is. The word liberal, when we're talking about a liberal democracy, really just means free. Free to think my own thoughts, free to believe what I believe, free to live out my life according to my convictions, free to choose and express my own religion, free to share in public what I believe to be right and true on any given topic or issue. And in a liberal democracy, I'm free to do these things, and you are too. And it's the role of the state, it's the role of the government to uphold these freedoms, to uphold these liberties, to make sure that you and I and everyone else have the freedom to live according to their conviction as long as it doesn't harm others. So, our individual freedoms, our liberties, are always limited by the state to some degree. For example, if I feel convinced that I deserve a new car, I'm not free to walk into my neighbor's house, grab his keys, and park his car in my driveway. In the same way, I'm not free to abuse my children if I feel that that is a reasonable form of parenting. Now, traditionally, the limits of our freedoms, the restrictions that are rightfully enforced on us by the state, by the government, have been limited based on the law of God. So where my convictions lie outside of God's prescribed law, God's way for living, then the state would have authority to restrict those things. This is a good thing. Where my own convictions directly oppose God's desire for life and liberty, my actions must be restricted. That's why the foundational basis for the laws of Canada come directly from the Ten Commandments. Now, we live in a time where the basis used for restricting personal liberties is shifting further and further away from God's law. 
which makes discussions like this one all the more important. We do need to think about liberty and the state's role in upholding or restricting those liberties, because it's their God-ordained role to do so, and because the state is one of the spheres of authority that we are called to submit to under the authority of Christ. So that's the word liberal. It expresses the idea that as people living in a nation, in the nation of Canada, we have freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of association. Generally, as long as it doesn't cause harm to others, we're allowed to live in the way that we want to live and believe the things that we want to believe, and the government ought to uphold these freedoms. In the early years of Canada and America's establishment, this upholding and restricting done by the government was intended to uphold biblical norms. Now, we clearly see that the standard for liberty is changing, not just to include alternative religious views, but even turning fully backward to directly oppose and restrict the Bible's influence on society. So you see the importance of this issue when it deals with liberality and liberal. Now, for the word democracy. Democracy just describes the type of government that we have. It's government by the people. Demo, root, uh, prefix meaning people or population. Krasi is the uh, Greek word for rule or power. So in a democracy, the people of the nation directly or indirectly govern that nation, affecting its laws and its policies. In Canada, we have a version of representative democracy. The people, that's us, we get to elect our leaders through a fair vote, voting process. We choose who will lead us, and then we trust them to make decisions that best suit our interest or reflect our beliefs. Now, there are some ways in which we can more directly influence law uh, in our nation, but that's basically it. We choose a leader, and then they do the leading and the decision making. And I'm sure you're already seeing how this isn't really a true democracy, particularly because the political party in power and even individual leaders have a great deal of power to make and change laws that may or may not reflect the beliefs of the people in general. And without getting too bogged down on that particular concept, we should at least understand that in Canada, we choose our political leaders by a democratic process, but we are not truly a democratic nation or a democratic society in the sense that the people rule or the people make decisions uh, for the greater group. So a liberal democracy then is a political ideology and a form of government in which elected leaders are given the task of upholding the individual rights and freedoms of the people in the nation. They're tasked with upholding our liberties. Sounds pretty good so far. So then we have the concept of illiberal behavior. Well, illiberal behavior is within a liberal democracy any time that the government restricts or suppresses the liberties that are generally yours under a liberal democracy. So in a democratic society, you are free to travel as you wish. If the government were to restrict your travel, that would be an example of illiberal behavior. They're restricting your liberty to travel. In a democratic society, another example, you're free to start your own business and to work. If the government were to restrict your ability to do that, they would be acting illiberally. That would be an example of illiberal behavior. You might immediately think, hey, this illiberal behavior, that, that's crazy. You can't do that. Down with illiberal behavior. But I'm sure you can think of specific times when it might be necessary, when it might be really important that the government step in and make decisions that would temporarily restrict your liberties and mine. So you can probably recall a couple of events in Canadian history that were important enough that the government needed to really step in and restrict the freedoms of the people or control the behaviors of individuals in really specific ways. Uh, one of them was really early in the 1900s, 
1914 to be exact. That's the beginning of World War I. Canada issued new legislation called the War Measures Act. So again, we're going to talk more specifically about the War Measures Act as it applied to World War I, but let's talk about just what could they do? What was the government able to do under this act, under the War Measures Act? And it's generally to uh, suspend your democratic rights, which you understand now. So they were allowed to do things like censor media. So at that time, media was radio, the things you would hear, or a newspaper, the things you would read. If those things were privately owned, it didn't matter. The government was allowed to take control of the broadcasting, things that were being said, things that were being written, and change it for their own purposes or write their own things in it. They were able to control what was being communicated using those means. They were also able to seize property. So they were able to, without explanation, without due course, they were able to take people's possessions or even take people's homes or take people's businesses, take control of them, even sell them to somebody else, things like that. And they did use it to do that. We'll talk about it uh, as, we, as we move forward. They were also able to arrest and detain, to hold against somebody's will, uh, anyone that they wanted without fair trial and without a warrant. They were able to restrict movement, so things like travel checkpoints. They were able to control manufacturing and trade. So they were able to uh, oppose the free market and they were able to uh, determine what privately owned factories would manufacture in, in this specific time. And of course that makes sense in wartime. Uh, they were also able to use military in ways that they typically wouldn't. So we think of military as the force that the government uses to protect our nation against attacks from other nations. Uh, they would have been able to use it in order to police their own people. They're also able to allow uh, to make decisions without involvement of parliament. So quick government decisions, quick law, quick legislation, without due process, without debate, those kinds of things. So you can already see it, it could be pretty troubling or it could be pretty useful depending on the circumstance. Let's dive into World War I and see how the War Measures Act was used in the years of World War I, 1914 to 1918, and even uh, the repercussions followed uh, a bit beyond that. So what did they do? Well, we already talked about they took control of factories and manufacturing in order to make sure that everyone in Canada was contributing to the war effort. They did those things with farms and food as well. Uh, and that, that sounds fairly useful. We also talked about the issue earlier of conscription. Conscription is the uh, attempt at forcing any able citizen of Canada to join the military effort, to join the army or to fight overseas. And that's a controversial issue, as we've read about in different provinces responding differently, uh, people of different ethnicities responding differently to the call to arms. It was also used, this War Measures Act was also used to justify internment camps. The Canadian government was able to take Canadian citizens whose ethnic background was, say, Ukrainian or German or Hungarian. We were able to take them out of their homes and place them into camps where they were forced to work and just generally not treated very well. And on top of that, often their property was taken and sold while they were being held against their will, so that after the war, they actually had nothing to go back to. Some of the things about the War Measures Act, uh, the way it was used, could be deemed necessary and helpful. But again, it's a controversial issue. Others could be deemed ridiculous and harmful. Any time we discuss an issue like this, it's going to be controversial. Shorter topic, uh, World War II, the War Measures Act was invoked again. It was used in a very similar way uh, to change manufacturing, to support the war effort. Uh, conscription was again uh, a factor and internment camps. We did a study on Japanese internment camps and you reflected on that uh, fairly thoroughly. The last time, so that's two times, uh, major issues in Canadian history relating to war, world wars, where the War Measures Act was invoked and used. And again, we can discuss the legitimacy of how it was used and the effects of its use. There's one other time in Canadian history 
where the War Measures Act was invoked. It was in 1970. You're going to do some reading about it in your textbook and take some notes, but before you do, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. It was called the October Crisis, or the FLQ Crisis. FLQ was a group uh, in Quebec that fought for the separation of Quebec from the rest of Canada. They didn't uh, make a lot of progress politically, so what they did is they started to use violence as a way to achieve their goals. They're responsible for several bombings and murders and threats in order to get their point across, to make themselves known and to make themselves heard. In October 1970, members of the FLQ kidnapped two politicians, uh, one, one British uh, representative and a member of parliament. And they made a lot of demands holding these prisoners hostage. Parliament invoked the War Measures Act, which allowed them to arrest and detain anyone that they thought was associated with FLQ to get them to the bottom of this, the top, I suppose, of this association and the bottom of the crisis that we were in and to release these prisoners, uh, the kidnapped individuals. You're going to read about that, take some notes and do further reflection uh, from, from the textbook as you continue on in this lesson. Thanks for listening.